Hello adventurers and welcome back to my channel. Today we are high atop Lookout Mountain where we have a very unique attraction. Did you know that there is actually a Buffalo Bill Museum here in Colorado? In fact, just a short distance off of I-70, you can find not only the museum, but the graveside of Buffalo Bill here at Lookout Mountain. So today we're gonna to actually be going inside this building right behind me and checking out all that there is here at that museum and then taking a short walk over to the graveside. This is gonna be a unique one and if you're into Western history, this one is for you. We're about to enter in this door right here from the viewpoint. During summertime, they are open from May 1st until October 31st, nine to five. But during winter, which is November 1st through April 30th, they're only open Tuesday through Sunday and they are closed on Monday. So without further ado, let's go inside. Okay, adventurers, it's only $5 to come and visit the museum here, and already I am very excited. As we walk in, there are all of these amazing pieces of art that would have actually been used for the Buffalo Bill Wild West show. And then this mural right here beside me is actually a picture of what it was like to be there, like an actual picture. So many people would come out to the Wild West show. It was absolutely just like the most amazing thing on earth. Here we have Annie Oakley. William Cody was the kindest, simplest, most loyal man I ever knew. He was the staunchest friend. He was, in fact, the personification of the sturdy and lovable qualities that really made the West. Have you ever come to a place and you saw the building and you expected one thing and then you got inside and it blew you away and was something completely different? That is definitely this. Upstairs you just see a kind of small building. It doesn't look like it's a very big museum, but then you go down that first ramp into the main gallery and everything opens up and oh my goodness, there is a lot going on. And I just found out upstairs that they actually have a brand new video that they just rolled out. So you can come in and kind of pick it up in different sections and each section talks about something slightly different. So it runs continuously throughout the day. Now with that said, let's go exploring. Now William F. Buffalo Bill Cody actually earned his name when he was a hunter for the railroad. He gained his fame as an army scout and began to be become something of history whenever he became a legendary showman. Now, he also advocated for the equal rights of women and for his former Indian foes in his later years. It's pretty interesting to see some of the paintings and stories that are starting to unfold just down this first ramp. Now, Buffalo Bill was a showman to say the least. He was a promoter of events. He was a promoter and uplifter of people. And as we kind of go through here, you can see that that he was something of a spectacle within all the communities that he would touch with his traveling shows. It's pretty neat to see kind of the pieces here. And I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna dip into the showroom, which is right over here first, kind of get a little bit of backstory. And then I'm gonna show you some of these pieces because these pieces are really cool. Okay guys, let's set the tone here. I just watched the video all the way through and it was absolutely amazing, you need to watch it. But it provides a lot of context toward Buffalo Bill. And I think that the part that kind of sets the pace for the museum the most is actually from that little family tree over there. When we look at it, we notice that you can see generations and generations of his family, but 
His life actually started out when he was only 11 years old. He had to become the man of the house because his dad spoke out against having slaves in Kansas. He didn't think that slavery should be a thing that they had there. And as a result, he was stabbed and he actually passed away. So at the time, Cody had to actually step up and figure things out. And he took a series of different jobs, which put him into different kinds of positions that ultimately landed him as a scout, which had connections with the Native Americans as they kind of moved through the West. That's kind of what set the tone for everything. From there, he ended up having a chance encounter with an author who wrote dime novels. And the guy just thought his stories were so fascinating that he kind of made a fictionalized version of him, which later went on to become Buffalo Bill. And Cody eventually kind of morphed into that showman that was presented in those dime novels. So with that said, let's go look around. Now echoing some of the themes within the video, you can come here and follow a small timeline that is actually set into chapters. Chapter one is life in the outdoors. He actually grew up enjoying the areas that we actually are in right now. He became the man of the family at only age 11, and his first job that he really took was riding for the Pony Express. So he started off delivering mail back and forth, mostly for the military. Now, it wasn't long before, um, while he was on his path toward becoming a man, he actually met someone and decided to get married. And that started his life as a married man. And he was going to settle down and try to just live in one area. However, he was then recruited as a scout. And that's when he started working with the Native American people. So his family was living in Leavenworth, Kansas. And then he went back out into the wilderness. And during this time, he served a variety of different purposes, but this is where he became known as Buffalo Bill. And along the way, this name came from him actually hunting for providing for the railroad men, the bison in Buffalo in the area. So despite the fact that we have many times seen him in this really nasty light of he made them extinct, he did not. He actually hunted for a sustainable amount just to supply the people on the railway. And then from there, some of the stories began to grow. It says here that in 1867, he was hired to provide meat for the workers for the railroad. And that's where this part of the story begins. Even though he was considered to be the exterminator of the buffalo, there were actually millions upon millions of buffalo roaming at that time, and he barely put a dent in it, only working for the railroad for about 17 months. So that is in fact a legend. Along the lines you'll also find some of the very interesting items that he might have used, including the Springfield rifle. And then he actually received a Medal of Honor, and he had an Indian Wars Medal as well. Now I mentioned he actually met an author who created dime novels about him and he kind of morphed into this character. Well this is the character that most of us have had the stories and dealings with, Buffalo Bill. And this was an inflated version of who he really was. It was kind of a fictionalized kind of ride across the plains, save the world kind of the west was one kind of moment. But he started to embody this character so that he could market it to do something kind of special. See at the time the western push for civilization had started moving railroads and large communities in and Buffalo Bill looked around and said hey this isn't the place that I remember this isn't the place that I grew up and this isn't how it happened so he started to create his Wild West show to share some of those kind of themes of what he recalled and as he did that, it became quite the show and blurred the lines of reality and fiction a little bit, just like the dime novels had. Here we find an actual script from Buffalo Bill in the 20 days, and then also one of the dime novels that actually highlighted his story. There is a magazine here, an autobiography, and the timeline continues. And as it does, you can find all sorts of different pieces of what has made Buffalo Bill the person that he became in his later years. 
Now, a lot of people thought that since Buffalo Bill actually worked as a scout for the military, that he was also very anti-Native Americans, but that wasn't the case. He actually forged relationships, learned to communicate, and had kind of a really interesting communication with them that was unlike anybody else. And kind of dating back to whenever he was younger, you can kind of tell his life was not the same as many who thought people weren't equal. In fact, he treated everyone kind of with respect based on their merit and what they brought to the table. So this kind of went into the Native Americans as well. So whenever he started his Wild West show, he wanted them to be a part, but he didn't just want them to be a part, he wanted to pay them equally. This wasn't the only group though. He also wanted to pay women equally. And as the show began to grow, he brought in different people from different lands. Again, all being paid equally. He thought if people brought something to the table that was the same as the next person, that they should be paid as such. And so the story of Buffalo Bill took a different chapter. Now in the main case here you can see some of the photos of the Wild West show and some of the depictions as we go along. Now these were staged performances and again the lines were blurred slightly. So reality and fiction many times were depicted much differently. Some people in later years have said that they wish that their family members, especially the Native Americans, had not have worked within the show. However, many of those who worked within the show did return year after year because the pay was very good and they actually forged family-like bonds with Bill and other members of different races and creeds. Now before his Wild West show began, he actually lost a son to Scarlet Fever and he was absolutely devastated by this. He carried this with him into his later years, even speaking on it. But along the way, he adopted a new family with his stage family and treated them all just as well as he would of his own child. At one point, he even took in a foster son. This was Johnny Baker, and he would grow up and be a part of the show, but he would also stay with the family as a part of the family up until Buffalo Bill's death. He was actually the same age as Kit Carson, which was his son who had died from scarlet fever. He always took a liking to him and he mentored him as though he were his own child. Now it wasn't always simple. The Wild West show was a lot of moving parts and with those moving parts, things happen. So as we kind of go along, we can see that there were always challenges, but no matter the challenge, they managed to overcome. In fact, there's one such challenge in this case right here that talks about the disaster in New Orleans and what happened after. And this was early on in the Wild West show and it proved to be something absolutely terrifying. However, again, the show must go on and it did. In fact, if you follow this section of the timeline right here, the disaster in New Orleans happened in the winter of 1884 and they had gone to the World's Industrial and Cotton Centennial Exposition. On the way down the Mississippi, the riverboat actually sunk and people barely escaped. It ended up putting them in a lot of debt. However, they did not give up. Right after that, that is whenever Annie Oakley ended up entering the picture and she changed and revolutionized the way that the show would run in way of presenting women. Shortly after Annie Oakley joined, the Lakota Chief Sitting Bull actually joined the Wild West show in 1885. He wasn't like the other Indian performers though. He did not appear in the reenactments of battles. He was presented as the great leader of the Lakota and was uplifted for his contributions to the Lakota tribe. He was treated with respect and in the showing, he actually was shown to the public so that they too would see him with the respect that Buffalo Bill had for him. Here you can actually place your hand on the button and hear Buffalo Bill's voice. Ladies and gentlemen, You'll notice in that sound clip that he actually says, Welcome, 
rough riders of the world. And he meant it. He actually had people in the Wild West show from across the world. He brought in different groups of people from different nations, different countries, different creeds, different fashions. And he wanted to portray all of them so that he could show a unified front of how people in the world could get along and do these amazing things. And it was said in many quotes that they sat down and they all broke bread together. They were all friendly. They all lived together in their traveling city of the Wild West show. And he wanted to use this as an example of how we really could get along as people. And I think that's great. His earlier years back here kind of lead people to believe that he had one particular perspective. However, I think in his later years, he more than made up for the fact that there were some things in his past that he didn't love. He tried every single day, I think in his later years, to make sure that people knew that Buffalo Bill cared for people and he respected people. And I think that's great. As time passed on, these thoughts of how he was going to expand his ongoing show actually kind of played into some interesting themes. Uh, some sponsors, some deals, things like that, like normal days, but also some political moves. And those political moves actually helped to forward the cause of some of the Lakota Indians. In fact, there's one thing that it shows right here, it's called the ghost dance, and I, I think it's fascinating. I would definitely pause to read the two letters that are displayed here, but it says here that in 1890, the Lakota became involved with a new religious movement called the Ghost Dance. It was a peaceful movement, but the government seemed to think that it was not okay. And Buffalo Bill actually negotiated for the leaders of the Ghost Dance to join the Wild West in 1891 with their tour of Europe. He did this so that this could get them out of prison and it would also remove them from the United States so that they could not be further persecuted or prosecuted for their actions and so that the tensions could simmer down just a bit. As they traveled through Europe for the next couple of years, they actually were given tons of respect from the Wild West show, something that they hadn't been given by the US government. And it also enabled them to make money while they were gone to help forward the cause for their tribes back home. Now from the age of 11 to the age of 47, night and day. By 47, he was actually considered a worldwide celebrity. He had toured Europe in the United States. He was actually a consultant for the US military when it came to Indian affairs because he had such a good working relationship with the different tribes. And there were a lot of other things that started to kind of flow his way. So a huge difference. And if you think about it from a childhood trauma of standing up for what you believe in and as a result being murdered to this place he was doing what he thought was right and it was paying off as opposed to what his father had done that he thought was right and it ending in a different way so i think that this is a huge thing but there's more this part right here i love equal rights for women he actually came out and stood up for women's suffrage. He ended up meeting Susan B. Anthony while he was in Chicago, and he decided that he was going to start doing his part to advocate for the right for women to vote. Because women had been a part of his show for some time, and they had been treated with equality there, so they should be on an international stage. Now again, going back to the video, the video actually said that when they would parade through towns to promote the Wild West show, you would have all of these women prim and proper looking on, seeing all of these other women participating in the show. And they would come out with their husbands or their kids and things like that. That. and then they would see people like Annie Oakley who was a quintessential woman she had her waist cinched she could do all of these amazing things just like the guys like shooting the guns but she would be wearing
wearing like a split pant almost or a split dress or not riding side saddle she would just be riding a horse like a normal person and it was kind of inspirational because that was something you didn't see at that time so for him to take a stance in a main big publication and say yes women deserve rights was a big deal now if you've ever seen cody wyoming yes this was a project of buffalo bill he wanted to see this town come to life and unfortunately before his passing he never saw it get to the point that it is today now cody today is an ongoing evolution it is a gateway into the Yellowstone National Park and it is also a place where you can go and see a rodeo all the time and this is actually intentional to honor Buffalo Bill. Now as you can imagine Buffalo Bill was a busy busy man and trying to found a town running his Wild West show dealing with all of the things and affairs of his family it got to be a lot and this took a toll eventually on some of his friendships and also his relationships and in his later years he did face some struggles however through these struggles he always managed to pull it together and figure it out because again the show must go on even if the show is actually real life and one of those relationships was actually the relationship with his wife. Him being gone so much took a toll and eventually this led to her wanting to get a divorce. Whenever it was filed, however, the judge did not allow it and ultimately they stayed separated for almost five years before reconciling. There is a note here and it's actually written out here as well so that you can read it. It's, it's actually kind of good. I, I really like stuff like this because it gives you the personal side and not just the showman. Now in 1910, he was getting older and he was getting tired and he wanted to focus on his actual life and relationships and he decided it was time for a farewell tour. However, farewell isn't really farewell when you're Buffalo Bill. You, you don't have that luxury. So again, the show pressed on. By this time, the show had morphed into something very different. Though it had the same central themes, you also had lots of performers from different countries who were doing all sorts of different unique things. This is some of the cast from that 1910 show when originally he had thought it was time to just hang it up. As he had spent a lot of money on investments, it made it harder and harder for him to get to a point where he could truly retire. So instead he pushed forward and he tried to find new investments. He tried to sell his story, there was a movie production potentially in the works, there were some circus thoughts, and these all took him to what we would know as his final resting place of here in Colorado. Now a few things happened at this point. It was said that he once said the show business isn't quite what it used to be and he was right. The world was changing and with that people were refocusing their interest in different things and there were so many people who depended on him and the pressure got to be a lot but at one point in time when he was here in the Colorado area he actually sat down with his wife and his priest and he reflected on a thought that he had had several years before. That Lookout Mountain, right here where we stand, would be a great place for him to call his final resting place. He knew his days were numbered and he made this request of them. So, they made sure that it happened. Again, we're going to go out to that final resting place in just a few moments and check it out. However, let's finish up in here. It is said here that he had two final shows. The first was his funeral, the next was his burial. On January 14th, 25,000 people passed by his coffin. Thousands more watched the procession itself. The procession came all the way out to Denver's Lookout Mountain and his burial was on June 3rd, 1917. Here are some of those photos and as you can see a lot of people 
came out to see Buffalo Bill one last time. Now Lookout Mountain is actually part of the Denver Park System and when he was placed here he wasn't placed in a common cemetery with a lot of people. He was placed here with intention and it took something to get him here. But as you can see there was a large crowd of supporters who were in favor of this. In this case right here it actually talks about the legacy of Lookout Mountain and there's some really fascinating things including the horn that the taps were played on, a cast of his hand, and um, a little bit of controversy. Quincy Record actually played taps on this bugle at the burial. This is an actual plaster cast of his hand that was made very shortly before his passing. A copy of the newspaper from the day. At the time, it was one cent to get a newspaper. The line of people who proceeded up Lookout Mountain was vast, with people using cars and even walking up. Now this section right here talks about the controversy. And the controversy is kind of interesting because it says here that at one point in time, people assumed that there was a tank out here to protect the body of Buffalo Bill because they were afraid that they would have grave robbers. There was a bounty placed on his body to bring it to Cody, Wyoming because they thought that that's where it should have been. But this is where he wanted to be right here. It says here that for months, his uh, final resting place was only marked with a pile of stones and a crude sign. In 1918, he was given a stone marker and then the fence that was built that we more currently see. Here we see the story behind the museum itself. Johnny Baker actually wrote a letter to the city of Denver saying he had a collection which to the visitors of Lookout Mountain would be of great interest. He wanted to build a building that would stand next to the tomb and share all of the different things from this collection. At first, the museum was just filled with the memorabilia from Buffalo Bill, which included the saddles and guns, some of his outfits, some of the things we've seen today. They wanted to keep it where it was free admission at that time so people could come and pay their respects to him for many years. Today, the museum actually creates a safer place in a controlled environment for the artifacts so that we can see them for years to come. And this was Johnny. Johnny was the one who he had taken in as his own son and made feel as though he was a part of the family. The impact of that move was so vast that even in Buffalo Bill's death, he wanted him to be honored and respected. Now, after going through that one gallery, I think that the moral of the story is how you treat people actually can make a difference. I in this section, you can create your own beaded design. Now this is something that has great value and sentiment to the native people and different designs mean different things. So just learning about how that the bead designs were created and creating your own pattern is something that allows you to kind of connect with the Native Americans. More interaction right here. Distant cousin of the gray wolf has adapted well and lives in all areas. What is it? It's the coyote. Antique firearms, wow. It not only tells you a little bit about them, but you have this great illustration from the Wild West show behind it. Tells you when they were used, and then also what kind that they are. Some of the photos from the Wild West show, those are awesome. I just, I love seeing all of these older photos. This is just really neat. It not only shows you the gun themselves, but who might have been using it, what they might have been doing in the show. Just really cool stuff. This is Adversary to Advocate. And in here, there are a collection of amazing pieces. This one is actually Short Bull's headdress. And this one was mentioned in the video as well. This was actually given to Buffalo Bill. 
At the time of Buffalo Bill and his advocacy for the Lakotas, nobody else was really standing up for them and trying to help them out. And I think that's one of the reasons why he took such a proactive stance because he saw them as the people that they were instead of the monsters that a lot of people depicted them to be. Even though some of his shows had themes that were a bit more controversial, when it came down to him actually speaking to the people and having relationships with them, they knew that all of that was just Hollywood hype and showcasing. So I think that that's what makes it so fascinating to know that they actually gave him things that were so powerful to them. The headdresses are such an important thing. They have such a significance. But they have said that if you put it out there into the universe, you end up getting it back. And truly they did. They put out their headdresses and their pieces of jewelry and things like that that they would share and they were given back these friendships that lasted a lifetime. Actually after Buffalo Bill had passed there was a letter that was written to the family from the Native Americans and it's in the video you have to watch but it will actually just punch you in the gut. It's, it's so meaningful and you can see that that was something that was a real thing. This exhibit asks you to look and find out if Buffalo Bill ever actually visited your community. So I'm from Texas and wow, look at all this. Different dates, different places, all of these. Now some of these are actually pretty close to where I live. Denton, Wichita Falls, yeah, that's really awesome. So somewhere in their history, they probably have photos of this very production. I always say on my adventures that different places tie to different places that you go or might see and I think that this is really neat because you could actually find out if this location here in Colorado actually ties back to where you are from or where you have been and that is why we love to come out to places like this. Now as we wrap up this gallery and go outside, there's another video that you can also sit down and watch inside the main gallery area. Just, it's a silent video, it's really neat though. And I encourage you to check that out also because it actually shows some of the scenes from the Wild West show, which is pretty cool. Um, even back then they did have video, so it's really neat. There's also some different publications who have written about the Wild West show and some of the cabinets, definitely check those out. You'll find one that actually is written by Mark Twain himself, super cool. And uh, with that said, let's go upstairs and outside. Okay, now we have moved outside and there are so many different points that you can check out the views over here and also behind the museum, tons of overlooks. Now, the reason that Buffalo Bill wanted to choose this selection for his home was because at the time there were no trees. You could see in every direction, but some things have changed. So we're off to find out what the view looks like now.
Now the signs around again, I do recommend going inside the museum, but they are in English and Spanish for all of those who have come here to check it out. I think that's wonderful because he was a person who was all about inclusion. So adding a secondary language to that because he has fans from around the world. That's amazing. Some of the frequently asked questions that people have and that way they can understand a little bit more of the story but this sign actually overlooks the gift shop area and then also some of the amazing looks that Buffalo Bill would have had where he would have been able to see the plains where he grew up and the mountains where he loved to play.